for them. And I'm just getting to know Temple Baptist, and now you're one church. So Temple Baptist, Law of Liberty, everybody, one church, praise God. Glad you're here tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward, I truly am, for uh, great things ahead. I know God is already doing great things, and He has great plans here. Uh, this is not by an accident uh, that you're here tonight. God has a plan, and God has a purpose. And uh, I'm just, I'm, I really am, I'm excited uh, to see what God's going to do here in this place. Keep your finger there in Psalm 102 while you're there. Uh, I'm going to read from Job 38. You can turn there if you'd like, but... Oftentimes, our world revolves around us. Now, we may not think of it that way, but, but uh, that is truly how it is. We think of any, everything relative to our lives. But here's something we need to realize. Job 38 makes this clear. Verse 25, it says, "Who?" Job is, uh, God is asking Job some questions. He says, "...who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters, or a way for the lightning of thunder?" To cause it to rain on the earth, now don't miss this, where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground and to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Our worlds revolve around us. But here's what we need to remember. Here, and this verse is what really uh, spoke to my heart as I read it. Folks, this life, this world, it's not about me. It's not about you. Um, our world revolves around us, but here He causes it to rain in places where no man is. Why is that? Well, because everything here, everything created, it's not about us. It's about Him. Everything was created by Him and for Him, for His glory. This church is here, not for us, not for you, not for me. This church is here for His glory. It all exists for Him. It belongs to Him. Uh, as a matter of fact, the preachers were in God's hand. The God, Jesus Christ is in the midst of the candlesticks. This is His church. That's so important to remember that, to understand that. I think it's a wonderful thing when a church member or a pastor says, My church, and they take ownership and they invest finances and they invest their, their sweat equity and they invest their talents for God's glory. But at the end of the day, let's not forget, this is Jesus' church. It's Jesus' church. And it's here for His glory. It's here to do His work. With that in mind, let's go back to Psalm 102. And sometimes the world feels really big and we feel really small. And we wonder, do I even matter to God? Does this church matter to God? Do the individuals in this church matter to God? And what I want to tell you here, Psalm 102, is sometimes if we're not careful, we can have a pity party. And we can begin feeling sorry for ourselves. In fact, here, David in Psalm 102, I just want you to notice this one verse. Thank you, brother. What was your name again, brother? Thank you for reading that. Psalm 102, verse 7, the psalmist wrote, I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. The title of the message tonight is this, The Lonely Sparrow. The Lonely Sparrow. He said, I watch and am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Uh, I have a sister in Michigan. I have a sister in Omaha, Nebraska. My sister in Omaha, Nebraska is a pastor's wife. And uh, they serve the Lord out there in Omaha, Nebraska. And one time we went to visit them. And they took us to the Henry Dorley Zoo. How many of you ever heard of the Henry Dorley Zoo? Nobody here. If you ever go to Omaha... You want to go to the Henry Dorley Zoo. As a matter of fact, my, my uh, brother-in-law told me, he said, or my sister rather, told me, when you're in town, we'll take you to the zoo. Well, I'm sorry, for most guys, you hear that, it's just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, that's great, yeah. You, know, you have a shooting range, you have uh, any go-karts, you know, go 50 miles an hour, that sounds fun. She's like, no, we're going to take you to the zoo. I'm like, okay, the kids will probably love that. You know, they'll love it. I loved it. It was amazing. It, it really was incredible. They have these domes they, they've built, and, and there's entire ecosystems within the domes. 
Uh, for instance, we went in one that was a desert dome. It was just like the desert, like Jacksonville, just like the desert. Very hot. And uh, reptiles and foxes and unique birds. And went to another section, gorillas and hippos and orangutans and lemurs. One of our kids pulled out a laser pointer and the lemurs start smacking each other uh, while they're chasing the laser. Uh, we saw the sea lions and the tigers and the sloth bears and the snow leopards and the giraffes and the rhinos. And we went to the aquarium and we saw sharks and jellyfish and stingrays and sea turtles. Turtles. We went to the jungle house and they had fruit bats flying everywhere and Titus had his hat, he took his hat off and he caught one. I don't know if you're supposed to do that, but he did. He caught, he caught a fruit bat. I was so proud of him at that moment. And, uh, you know, th those were amazing creatures to see. And then we went to a little snack area in the Henry Dorley Zoo and I noticed that God brought my attention. There on the ground were some crumbs, some food someone had left behind. And there was a little sparrow, a little sparrow running around eating those little crumbs of food. And the Holy Spirit of God got my attention through that little sparrow eating those little crumbs of food. You know, nobody there at the zoo that day came to see a lonely sparrow. Nobody cared. That sparrow was running around. Nobody cared. Nobody gave it a second thought. Oh, but there was one who saw it. There was one who cared about it. Our Heavenly Father saw it. Our Heavenly Father saw that one little sparrow. Uh, January this year, I was up in Michigan with my parents, and uh, we were just taking care of some last-minute details. My dad went to heaven March 31st. I'm so thankful to know he's with the Lord, and I'm going to see him again someday. But in January this year, I was driving with my parents. And by the way, let me say this. You know, we were, uh, I took them out to eat, and my parents are Dutch. How many of you know what that means? That means they're tight with money, okay? <laughs> that's good. And they're literally Dutch, and they're literally tight with money. And that's a good thing. And we went out to eat at a restaurant, and I, and I told my dad, I said, we're buying dessert. He goes, no, we're, we don't get dessert. We're getting dessert. We don't know the last time we're going to do this. And it was the last time we got to go out to eat with my parents before my dad went to heaven. What I'm saying is make the moments count with your family. Tell them the things you want. Tell them the things you would have said at their service one day. Hey, by the way, forgive right now. You have bitterness in your heart. Forgive somebody. Amen. Forgive them. Uh, speak the words of love that you will speak one day when they're gone. Tell it to them right now. Hey, if you would have sent them flowers after they're gone, send them flowers while they're alive. Anyway, we, we spent some time together. We were driving down the road, and suddenly we came around a curve, and right in the middle of the road was a bald eagle first bald eagle I'd seen that close. It was right in the middle of the road. It was eating its prey. It killed something. It was in the middle of the road. We come around the curve. The bald eagle took off flying. Those beautiful white feathers spread out behind it. And it flew up onto a wire. And I said, wow, look at that. It's a bald eagle. And we went and did our errand. We came back and I was looking for it. Didn't see it again. Last month, we were driving out to Nebraska to visit my sister and my brother-in-law and their children. And saw two, not one, but two bald eagles on our way in Iowa. You know, I've never driven by a house and suddenly said, everybody stop. Look, it's a sparrow. Have you ever done that? Everybody just stop, it's a sparrow. Why not? Who cares? Who cares? Sparrows are common. They're nothing. Hold on. To God, there's something. Right. You see, it's an amazing thing to me. Again, this church, look, this church matters to the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Folks, this church, every individual in this church, every, from the youngest child to the oldest adult, everybody in between, you matter to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, I want to show you how amazing our God is. Number one, your Heavenly Father knows exactly where you are. He knows where you are. He notices you. He cares about you. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. And again, I, I know we understand these. We claim we do. We claim we believe these things. But I'm telling you, God doesn't just see you uh, uh, massed in with all of humanity. He sees you individually. He knows how many hairs are on your head and how many used to be there, too. He knows both. He cares. He cares. 
The Bible says in Psalm 139, His thoughts towards you are more than the sands by the sea. And in Matthew 10, 29, notice what it says. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Can I ask you a question? Does God waste any words in His Word? He doesn't. Is He speaking in hyperbole? Is He exaggerating here? Or does He literally mean that not one sparrow falls on the ground without our Heavenly Father? Folks, He literally means it. That's how in tune He is with His cre creation. Verse 30, He says, But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. If God cares that much about a little insignificant bird, how much more does He care about you? Verse 31, Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Your heavenly Father knows where you are. Look at Luke chapter 12, please. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 6. Luke chapter 12, verse number 6. Jesus says, are not five sparrows, think through this for a minute, are not five sparrows, earlier he said two sparrows are sold for a farthing, don't miss this, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? Hold on, that means there's an extra sparrow thrown in for free. It's, it's worthless, right? Just thrown in for free. But notice what Jesus said, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings and not one of them? is forgotten before God. That extra sparrow is not forgotten. And if God knows where that extra sparrow is, folks, He knows exactly where you are. He knows where your church is, yes, but He knows where you are as an individual. I, I'm, I am thrilled. I really, I, you know, I keep saying this because I am for your church, what God is doing here, what He's already done, but what He's going to do. Because I if think of our own church in Kentucky, how uh, the Lord provided. And some of you here last year, you heard my own brief story of how God provided uh, for our church. But I remember sitting in our church building, and I remember another church touring through the building and and being told there was an offering that we may not be meeting there. We might be meeting in a cafeteria. We might be meeting in, in a park. But we're going to have church because church isn't the building. It's the people. And I remember just praying, Lord, you brought us this far. You didn't bring us this far to leave us. And I went to look for buildings and I was praying about buildings. Make a long story short, God left us right where we are in the building we are. And I thank God for it. But as I was looking for buildings, I went to an industrial park and I came to a little storefront building that was for sale. Had no money, couldn't buy it, but I'm just praying, seeing what God's going to do. And I looked through the window, and I looked down on the floor. Do you know what was on the floor? A sparrow that had died. It was laying right there inside the window, and the Holy Spirit of God again grabbed my attention. You might understand sparrows are a big deal to me, because they're a big deal to God. God got my attention and said, look, I know where that sparrow is. And if I know where that sparrow is, I know where you are. Amen. I know right where you are. Uh, Job 23, go to Job 23, please. I want you to see this. Sometimes we go through trials, troubles. Maybe it's a health problem. Maybe it's a relationship problem, a financial issue. Maybe somebody lied about us or criticized us and we're pained at our hearts. We want to lash out. We know better than that. We, want, we are supposed to respond like Christ would respond. And in Job 23, I want you to remember Job. He lost everything. He lost his children. He lost his wealth. Uh, his friends, they were real friends, but they came and started to figure out, try to figure out why he was going through his trouble. And they began to accuse him and say, you know, you've been doing this. You've been doing that. And they didn't understand why God was bringing him through. And I want you to see what Job said in Job 23, verse 8. He says, Behold, I go forward, but He, God, is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive Him. What's Job saying? I'm trying to figure out what God's doing in my life in the midst of this trouble. I, I don't understand. I, I'm trying to figure it out. Why is God allowing me to go through this? I don't know. I go forward, but He is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive Him. On the left hand, where He doth work, but I cannot behold Him. He hideth Himself on the right hand, that I cannot see Him. I can't figure out what God's doing. I don't know where God is in this awful mess I'm dealing with. Hold on, but verse 10. But He knoweth the way that I take. I don't know what God's doing, but He knows right where I am. 
He knows the way that I take. And when He hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held His steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of His lips. I have esteemed the words of His mouth more than my necessary food. Folks, number one, your Heavenly Father knows right where you are. Number two, go to Matthew 6. Your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Now, do, do we really believe that? Hold on, do we believe that? Do we just give lip service to that? Or do we actually believe that our Heavenly Father knows far better than we do what we need? Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. Notice what the Bible says when we pray. Matthew 6, 7, he says, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. Does God know what you need? He knows where you are. Does He know what you need? He does. Do you know sometimes He'll allow a difficult person into your life because it's exactly what you need. Yeah. Do you hear what I said? Amen. It's exactly what you need. He, he's going to knock some rough edges off of you. And by the way, you think of that difficult person and somebody else thinks of you. you know? <laughs> that, that's the point. The point is, your Heavenly Father's in, in control. Amen. He is. He's in charge. He knows where you are. He knows what you need. When Paul uh, had his thorn in the flesh, and I, again, I believe, it was, uh, I believe it was the disease of his eyes. Now, there's debate over that. I'd never debate anybody over it. That's what I believe. Whatever it was, it was something that Paul said, if I didn't have this, I could serve you better, Lord. And he said, I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And what did the Lord say to him? My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in necessities and distresses in persecutions for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know what God said, Paul? You need the thorn in the flesh. When we think of our needs, we think of food, we think of shelter, transportation perhaps. But God knows every need we have. Philippians 4.19, it's a promise. My God shall supply all your, what's the next word? Need. Is there a di difference between our need and our wants? There is. But He said He'll supply all your need. Matthew 6 makes it clear that the very fact we're alive and here today says God has provided our needs. My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I had an older pastor years ago when we first moved into our building where we are. Uh, there was a lot of work to be done. A lot of work. I, I can sit here and tell you a lot, my own sob stories about the work we had to do. And you know what that older pastor said to me? is great advice. He said, Tim, he said, I want to tell you, there's never been a time in my ministry where I felt like I had everything I needed. You know what his point was? His point was, I did have everything I need. Amen. But yet I didn't feel like it. I just felt like there was more I had to have. And look, God said He'll supply your need. He knows where you are. He knows what you need. There are many things we need. Among things, we need His Word. Matthew 4.4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's what I appreciate about your church. You have a love for the Word of God. We need God's Word. This, is, this isn't a hobby. This isn't just our preference. We have to have God's wisdom, God's guidance. Amen. Other things we need, we need His house. Look, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You stay faithful in church. Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Say, I don't need exhortation. I, I don't need somebody to lift me up. Let's pretend that for a minute. Let's pretend you don't need anybody to exhort you. Did you know just by showing up in church, you exhort other people? Right. Do you know when you come to church, I'll tell you, it'll transform your life. If you'll show up to church and say, "Not hey, what can I get out of the service? But what can I give? What can I do? How can I serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? How can I come together as a team in my church and you do a job for Jesus Christ? It'll transform your life. We need His Word. We need His house. Look at Psalm 84. Go, go there, please. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. 
Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. Notice it says, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Yea, the sparrow hath found an house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even thine altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will be still praising thee, Selah. In 1 Timothy 3.15, the Bible says, The house of God, and it's not speaking of a building. It's talking about the household, the family of God, the house of God, which is the church. If you're part of the church, raise your hand. You're the church. It's not the building. It's you. Notice what the church's job is. Listen, and every part of the body is needed to do the job. The house of God, the family of God, which is the church of the living God. Hey, we serve a living God. This isn't a religion. We serve a living God. Now notice the church's job were the pillar and ground of the truth. What does that mean? We as a church, our job is to support and uplift the truth. That's our job. Our job is to support and uplift the truth. And that is something we need. We need the church of God. There's a reason God put us in a church. There's a reason God started the church. We need the church. Next, we need His presence. What did Jesus say? Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For He hath said, I will never, what? Never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. Did you hear that? The Lord is my helper. And I shall not fear what man can do unto me. If you look to man for your help, you're going to be sorely disappointed. You need to look to the Lord. Number one, your Heavenly Father knows where you are. Number two, your Heavenly Father knows what you need. Number three, last of all, your Heavenly Father knows when you need it. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He hath made everything beautiful in His time. See, we live in a microwave society. Uh, you know, push a few buttons, have your TV dinner in about a minute or two. I, I don't recommend it highly, but we live in a drive-through society. You drive through, you give your order, within two or three minutes you have your food. If you don't have your food in five minutes, man, you're fit to be tied, right? If we're not careful, we, we think God operates that way. He doesn't. Can I explain something to all of us as children of God? God's not in a hurry. He's not. Right. Uh, his goal is to mold you, child of God, into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so that takes time, and He knows exactly what you need to do that, and He knows exactly when you need it. You know, what that requires is trust. It requires trust to believe these things, that not only does my Heavenly Father know where I am, He knows what I need better than I do. By the way, I've, I've had pastors criticize this. They say, you know, if you pray, Lord, Your will be done, that's a cop-out. You're just supposed to pray and ask God for what you want and kick the door down. Can I tell you a big mistake you can make? You can insist on getting what you want, and you might get what you want, and you won't want what you get. Right. It's so much better to say, Lord, this is what I want, but Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Lord, by the way, didn't Jesus tell us to pray that every day? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What's the next part? Amen. Thy will be done. Right. Can I remind you why we're here? For His will, for His glory, for His pleasure. Can I remind you why this church is here? For His will, for His glory, for His pleasure. Amen. His pleasure. Your heavenly Father knows when you need whatever you need. Go with me to Matthew 6, please. We're going to finish here tonight. Matthew chapter 6. Notice verse 24. Matthew 6, verse 24. The Bible says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the stuff of this world. By the way, what a fruitless life to, to waste a life chasing the stuff of this world when it's all passing away. And make your life count for something eternal. Get on board with the soul winning. Get on board with the outreach. Get on board with going after souls who are lost and going to hell. So one day you can get to heaven and have somebody walk up to you and say, hey, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember you. Oh, no, I remember you. You gave me a gospel tract. You spoke to me at the flea market. You knocked on my door. You brought me to church and told me about Jesus. And I've trusted Him as my Savior. Thank you. Amen. And that's what I want in heaven. The stuff of this world's passing away. That car you have to have is going to be a tin can someday. Yeah. That house you've got to have, that monument to materialism, it's just going to be a moldy pile of bricks and wood one day. Now, I'm not telling you don't enjoy your house and don't enjoy your car, but I'm telling you there's a whole lot bigger things to live for in life. Right. He said, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life, don't miss this, is not the life more than meat? And the body than raiment, the fact we're breathing God's air today, says God's taking care of us. Verse 26, Behold, the fowls of the air. I've, I've never again, I've never driven by a house. Now I do sometimes now just because I know what God's Word says about it. But most people don't drive by a house and say, Stop the car! Everybody get out! It's a sparrow on the housetop. But God knows where that sparrow is. That sparrow matters to Him. And if that spa sparrow matters to Him, so do you. How much more do you matter to Him? He knows what, where you are, what you need, when you need it. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. They don't plant. You don't see them out planting grain. Neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto a stature? If you worry about it, worry about it, can you grow bigger? No, you might actually shrink if you worry about it too much. <laughs> Notice next, why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. Verse 33 is the key. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Right. What does that mean? What's the kingdom of God? How can I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness? Well, I'll tell you this. There are souls walking all around us. Your neighbor, your co-worker, visitors that will show up to this church, that will show up to this church. And every one of them is going to spend an eternity in heaven or hell. Every one of them. How can I seek first the kingdom of God? How about make it a priority in your life? to be an integral part of your local church. And you help this local church, you help this body of Christ reach this area and the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Put that first. Amen. If this is what I want to do with my life, I'm going to tell you now, you can chase all that stuff and at the end of your life you'll have nothing to show for it. How about get invested here? Get invested now. Pour your life in for the cause of Jesus Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things. What things? All these needs we have shall be added unto you. Does God know where you are? Do you believe that? If you do, say amen. amen. You believe that? Do you believe He knows better than you do what you need? If you believe that, say amen. Amen. Do you believe He knows exactly when you need it? He does. 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow. 
For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Can I tell you what Jesus is saying? This seems so cliche, but it's absolutely the truth. Live one day at a time. Quit wasting your day. Quit wasting your energy. Quit wasting your time worrying about tomorrow. Live in the will of God today. You, you do God's will today. God can take care of tomorrow. The lonely sparrow. Psalmist said, I'm like a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Nobody stops and says, wow, it's a sparrow. But God does. He knows where it is. He knows where you are. He feeds that little sparrow. Sometimes I rejoice if I have a sandwich or something in my hand I, at lunchtime and I'm somewhere in a car. I, I actually do. I enjoy. I rejoice just pulling over, taking a little piece of food, throwing it to a sparrow and think God used me to feed that sparrow. Amen. Just like God knows where I am, He's going to take care of my need. Every time I see a little sparrow in a bush, every time. You can ask my family. One, one time my son and I were going to visit a hospital and uh, visit someone in the hospital. We pulled over as we're getting ready to enter the parking garage. There were five little sparrows taking a dust bath. I said, wow. We were both talking, wow, look at that. It's, a, it's five sparrows. God cares. He knows where they are. He knows what they need. He knows when they need it. And He cares for you. Let's bow our heads together for a moment, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I, I don't know all this crowd. I don't. I'm blessed to be here, to get to preach here with your church family. But I do want to ask this question. Is there anyone here? You, first of all, you'd say, Pastor, here's the truth. Here's the truth. If I were to step into eternity tonight, if I were to die tonight, I am not 100% sure I'd go to heaven. I'm not 100%. I might be 90%, 50%, 80%. I'm not 100% sure. I sure would like to be. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. No one's looking around. If that's you, would you slip your hand up? That's me. I'm not sure I'm saved. Lift, lift your hand. Anyone here tonight? I don't know this whole crowd. I don't, I don't, look, it'd be a terrible thing for you to come to church, and yet you don't even know Christ as your Savior. Is there anybody say, I, I don't know Christ. I don't know that I'm saved. Please pray for me. Lift your hand if that's you. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Who would say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I've believed on Jesus Christ as my Savior. I want to thank Him. He saved me. He's washed my sins away. I'm a child of God. And I want to thank Him and praise Him. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Would you just thank Him again? Don't ever get over that. You know, if the gospel ever gets old to you, tell it to somebody else. It'll be all new over again. Heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed. Church, I want to tell you, God knows where you are. As a church, He knows where you are. This, this place, the people in this place matter to God. Look, there are no big or little churches. That's absolutely true. This place matters to God. Your pastor is in Jesus' hand. Jesus is in the midst of this church. This place matters to Him. It matters. He knows where you are. As an individual, He knows where you are, what you need, and when you need it. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Bless it to our hearts now. May we understand how much we matter to You, Lord. Thank You for the simple illustration You've given us in Your Word. A sparrow nobody else cares about, but You do. And Lord, if You care about a little sparrow, how much more valuable are we? To you than sparrows. How much val more valuable is this church? Lord, I'm excited. I'm thankful for Law of Liberty Baptist Church and Temple Baptist Church coming together as one to do your work. Lord, this is not an accident. This is your plan. This, this is your guiding hand. Lord, I just pray that you'll just help each and every person understand how important they are to the work of your ministry here. Lord, bless in the few minutes ahead as Titus comes to preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor Fannin, do I turn over?